uh, okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and the sponsors to, uh, for letting me uh, talk here. It's a real pleasure to attend Q2B and even bigger pleasure to be able to present our findings to uh, such a wide audience. Uh, <coughs> we are a, a small startup based in Krakow, Poland, in, New in Europe. Uh, we also have an or our office here in Silicon Valley. And our original uh, plan when we established our company was to address hard problems uh, using our research, but the, our research was connected to computers that, the quantum computers that aren't going to be here for a while, that is error-corrected multi-qubit machines. So having realized that, uh, we still continued our research, but we also try to focus on current solutions. So every now and then, we take a look at uh, current hardware approaches. We try to understand whether they do what they are supposed to do. And we are trying to understand if it's possible to apply them to current real life problems. Um, so uh, this is going to be a slightly different than the previous two talks. So it's going to be a, a deep dive into one particular implementation. Uh, we are going to, I'm going first to present <coughs> a little theory so that we know what a, a Boltzmann distribution is. Then I'm going to formulate some questions and I'm going to report on our research uh, trying to answer these questions. Uh, it will turn out that we will provide some answers to our questions, but not completely. So. Uh, I will also share some tools we were using to answer the questions in the hope that some of the people from the audience would be able to continue our research and maybe deliver answers to the questions that we weren't able to uh, provide. Uh, okay, so as promised, we'll start with a little theory. Uh, okay, it works. So uh, basically, if we want to talk about uh, quantum Boltzmann distribution, we first need to have a graph. So a graph uh, are basically vertices, which we may call qubits or bits or variables, and some of them are connected uh, in pairs, some of them are not connected. The reason uh, for which I talk about that is that most of the real life problems arise in a situation when every two variables are somehow related to each other, somehow connected, have some connections with one another. But the hardware implementations that are present on the market usually do not permit that. So as you remember from yesterday's talks, uh, every particular platform has some kind of strange topology that only some of the bits are connected. So in order to translate a uh, real life problem with full connectivity, we do some kind of embedding. Uh, we're going to focus basically on five or four topologies. One of them is a fully connected graph. Uh, one of them is a chimera, so-called chimera graph. We will also introduce something new called chimera fragment, which is not going to be that bad. And I will also talk about the Pegasus topology. So the definitions of these things are rather tedious and technical, so I will try to provide a very quick intuition. I, I won't go, to, go into details because I won't want to bother you too much. Okay, so uh, the thing you see in the top is the, oh, actually one edge is missing. There's, there was supposed to be a horizontal edge somewhere towards the bottom. So the thing you see on the top is the complete graph, so every two vertices are connected with uh, one another. A typical problem, like for example, max 2 sat sometimes is expressed as something like that. Uh, the lower left picture is a chimera topology. It doesn't look that bad. Uh, basically, if you want to have an intuition how to build that, you have a, the kth chimera, chimera gra uh, graph is a k by k grid. And each, in each field of the grid, you have, you have four horizontal so-called horizontal vertices and four so-called vertical ver vertices. And within a particular grid, we have a full, complete bipartite graph. That is, each horizontal vertex is connected with each vertical. And 
they are not connected with one another with, within the families. And between the cells, uh, the horizontal vertices are connected to the, their corresponding uh, siblings in the neighboring cells to the left and to the right, while the vertical ones are connected with the siblings in the, in the neighboring so, uh, cells to the top and to the bottom. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, there is a very important uh, issue of embedding a real-life problem uh, from the fully connected complete graph to a particular topology implemented by hardware. Uh, this is done by, uh, by minor embedding. And basically what we do is we identify, we identify some of the vertices uh, in the chimera graph, in the hardware graph, with each other, uh, so that after collapsing them, we can express the graph we are looking for as a subgraph of uh, the hardware graph. So again, I don't want to go into details, but the Pegasus graph you can see in the lower right is an attempt at collapsing some of these vertices in hardware, not in software. Uh, the definition is quite complicated. Time is running out, so I won't bother you. So we do have a graph. So now, what is the Boltzmann distribution? Uh, Nathan has already told quite a lot about that. But intuitively, what you do is you assign a real number, a weight, or a bias to each vertex. And you assign a real number, a weight, or a coupler to each edge of the graph. So this is the definition of the problem. And uh, having done that, uh, to each bit, bit assignments of values to individual vertices, you can assign an energy. So basically, you add up the biases of the vertices uh, that have value 1, and then you add up the uh, weight of all the edges that have 1s at both ends. So you get a function that maps uh, an assignment of value 0, 1 to each vertex vertices, this assignment gets mapped to a, a real number. And now we are almost ready to say what a Boltzmann distribution is. So having the energy, we take the exponent of minus beta times this energy. And this is the weight associated with a particular state. Uh, of course, these weights not necessarily add up to 1. It may happen that they add up to 2 or 3 or 1 million. So we have to normalize it by dividing by something that is called z here on the slides. Uh, I won't go into the applications of uh, Boltzmann distribution, because uh, Nathan covered it nicely already. I will go into properties. So first of all, uh, it is <coughs> visible from the formula that taking samples from a uh, quantum Boltzmann distribution, uh, from a Boltzmann distribution, not necessarily quantum, uh, prefers low energy states. Moreover, the higher the value of beta, the stronger the preference for lower energy state is. And in practice, in hardware, beta is equal, is proportional to 1 over temperature. So if we want high values of beta, we want low values of temperature. So this is one of the reasons that uh, current hardware Hardware likes to be cool, be cold, because we want to uh, prioritize low energy states. Uh, the other thing is and, uh, something that you have probably heard multiple times uh, over the last couple of days is that it is not necessarily always the case that such a machine finds the global minimum, because finding a minimum is a much more difficult problem than actually finding something close to a minimum. And yeah, looking at the slide, another thing is that this can be used for quantum Boltzmann machines, but Nathan already covered that. So we have, an, we have the introduction. Now, we know what the Boltzmann distribution is. We get access to a, a sampler uh, that provides samples from a Boltzmann distribution, and we wanted to know what can we do with it. So we asked ourselves some questions. Oh, first question we ask ourselves, can we try to implement something that in, like that in software? Because it's always the question. It's very popular to 
uh, dequantize stuff. So we wanted to know whether it's possible to dequantize it. And then we wanted to know how noisy the hardware implementation is. So the samples coming from the uh, sampler, are they reasonably close to the quantum Boltzmann distribution? Do they uh, reach the minimum? And if not, how far from the minimum are they? That's basically what we wanted to know, and that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. So, of course, you can see that if we have, the posit if we have a positive answer for the text question, first question, that is, if we are able to implement some kind of software exact reference implementation of the uh, Boltzmann distribution sampler, the rest of the questions are going to be much easier because we can take a uh, cube problem, we can, we can take a assignment of weights to vertices and edges, uh, we can use our reference implementation to see what the minimum energy is, what the probability of getting the minimum energy is, uh, what the assignment of bits in the minimum state is, and compare it to whatever the uh, hardware implementation provides. And surprisingly, we were able to create such an implementation. Of course, but not for the whole, whole uh, 16 by 16 chimera graph, because that would be too difficult. Uh, basically, uh, we can observe that the chimera graph is so-called graph of limited tree width or bandwidth tree width. And it's fairly classical result from computer science that for such graphs, there is a number of dynamic programming techniques that allow you to compute almost everything associated to these graphs in reasonable time. So this has already been done at least part of our, our research. So about five years ago, Alex Selby provided a piece of code that uses similar techniques to find minimum uh, energy value for chimera graphs. However, he stopped at that, and we continued to uh, do much, much, much more. So what can we do? So we can do a lot. We can compute the uh, value of the mini minimum energy. We can compute the assignment of bits uh, for the minimum energy. We can compute the probability, the exact probability of attaining minimum energy for a given cubo problem. We can uh, sample multiple points from the Boltzmann distribution without uh, significant overhead. So as you can see in the, lower, in the lowermost line, there is an exponential uh, part of the complexity, but it doesn't involve, it's not multiplied by the number of samples. So there is a constant big uh, processing time, but the actual number of samples isn't uh, next to a very, very big factor. So of course, this doesn't contradict the thing that Nathan said, because this is a very, very special graph, and probably the example you have is not a chimera graph. It's something much more complicated, probably closer to a complete graph. So uh, if you want to play with it, th there, is a, there is a demo version. So the full version running on GPU uh, can solve any cubo in the uh, upper half of the 16 by 16 chimera. So that is 8 by 16 chimera. We have a very simple de demo version running on our web page. So it's a 4 by 16, one upper quarter of uh, the full uh, C16 Chimera graph, so it's 512 qubits. You can put a problem there. It will give you the energy. It will give the bit assignment. Uh, it's running on a dual uh, core machine, and I think it accepts something like 10 qps of traffic. So try not to overload it. If it stops responding, this means that there are, there, there are too many people trying to use it. Uh, OK, so we have an exact reference solver. It doesn't work with the whole, full, whole, the, the whole graph, but we can start answering our questions, because we can put a problem in the reference, sol reference solver and in the hardware implementation. Uh, so let's try to answer some questions. So first of all, we created a very simple multiplier or factorization circuit. So, uh, 
there has been something wrong with the resolution, so I think they are not, these slides are not particularly legible, but basically this is a graphical representation of a uh, C4, so, so Chimera 4 by 4 circuit that is supposed to multiply uh, numbers. So the input of this, of this thing are three numbers, one two-bit number, another two-bit number, and a four-bit number. And the uh, output, you could say, of this circuit is the following. If the first number times the second is equal to the third, then the energy will be zero. If it's not the case, the energy will be positive. So you can do some things. For example, you can set the value of the product to three, and setting the value is accomplished by giving very big positive or negative weights uh, to the qubits corresponding to the result, and you can ask to minimize the energy, and this will uh, mean that, I mean, uh, uh, this will cause the optimizer or the sampler to find the factors. And again, this was a very, this was a surprise to us that when we did that, that is, we asked this machine to factorize the number three, that is to find one of the two states, two ground states corresponding to the lower, uh, to the lowest energy. I mean, all the other states are invalid because there, is only two, there are only two ways of expressing three as a product of two integers. It happened that for some reason the sampler prefers to multiply one by three uh, rather than to multiply three by one. We have no idea why this happens, so we we turned to the creators of the sampler, and they suggested two things. They suggested one of the things is that there may be some ferromagnetic phenomena going on. That is that if you have a lot of weights uh, that have the same sign, so if they are concentrated in the same sign that they, I know that this is not formal talk, but they act a bit like magnets. So it's difficult for the uh, hardware to get out of a particular state, and it will, atta it will attract the solutions. Uh, the other thing they suggested is that we may have hit a particular uh, part of the, of the grid that is somehow not fully functional. So we tried addressing these two issues. So first of all, in order to fight the problem of concentrated weights with a uh, constant sign, there is a technique of spin flipping. So basically, you take half of the qubits, you flip their sign randomly, or you flip them randomly, you uh, adapt the weights of the, of the vertices and, and of the edges accordingly, you measure, and then you undo the, whatever flipping you did. You can do multiple passes of such bit flips. Unfortunately, it didn't help. So the only thing that changed is that instead of getting a correct answer every second, measurement, we got a correct answer every fourth measurements. But still, for some reason, the hardware preferred to multiply one by three, not three by one. So as promised, I asked a question, and I only provided a partial answer. So it doesn't seem to work perfectly. There is some strange preference towards one of the solutions. We tried many ways of circumventing that, but we failed. So if anyone else has an idea how to deal with it, uh, the tools are there. So the, uh, the demo sampler, the, the reference solution is on our web page. Uh, you can try the hardware implementation. It is publicly available, too. And there are many options you can play with in order to make it work better. We failed. Uh, anyway, moving on to the next question, attaining mi minimum energy. This is a very simple uh, example that was done by one of our researchers. So it's possible to tailor a very spiteful example on the full uh, 16 by 16 chimera graph that has a minimum theoretical energy of minus 1,000. But once you start taking samples, even with 10,000 samples, it will never go below 700. It, this is not particularly impressive because uh, this is not a fault of the implementation or some noisiness. This is the problem that the distribution from which the energy is taken is just a binomial distribution. So it has, it has a hill somewhere towards 700 or 600, and both the long tails are extremely low. So it's 
It's just a fun thing, just to repeat the statement that we were hearing here all the time, that these machines are not meant to find the minima. However, there is one more thing that I would like to add, and it again echoes uh, a lot that we have heard here, that if we take uh, any hybrid approach, a very simple hybrid approach that involves the sampler and some post-processing, these problems are no longer challenging. So it it's suffices to add a very simple local search to the samples that were provided by the sampler, and it finds the absolute minimum almost immediately. So again, repeating the same thing we've been hearing, hybrid approaches are good. So, uh, oh, no, this is too far ahead. Uh, so the two examples I said, uh, I presented, they were somehow unfair, because we created things that were specifically meant to uh, uh, show weaknesses of the hardware implementation. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, today is a fair approach. A fair approach is to take a random problem. What could be more fair than a random problem? So in order to produce a random cube problem, we need to answer two questions. Because we cannot just take any random coefficients, we need to know two things. First of all, what is the value of beta, that is the Boltzmann distribution coefficient used by the hardware implementation? And second, what is the precision of the weights that we are allowed to use? Because obviously, if you take too fine of a precision for the problem, the hardware won't cope because it has some kind of finite precision. So we started by a simple experiment of determining the precision of the hardware. The exact way we conducted this is that we performed uh, a lot of things that were supposed to be fair, co fair coin flips. So we set the bias of every single qubit to zero. We performed 10,000 uh, dice rolls. Oh, it's not dice rolls, coin tosses. And we see how far from a fair distribution it is. So looking at many experiments, exactly 20,000 experiments, it turned out that the probability of getting one can go as low as 30% or as high as 70%. If you do a little math, which I don't want to bore you with because there has been enough of it already, uh, it, will, it turns out that the uh, value of zero, the value of beta, beta energy is, that is supposed to be zero is treated as something between minus 0.8 and plus 0.8. So this seems to be a pessimistic noisiness of this thing. So if we were to give uh, coefficients that result in the en beta energy values be being integers, this would be unfair, because this thing doesn't really distinguish two uh, successful to, 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 to integers next to each other. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so we decided that our problem should be formulated in such a way that beta times energy is always an even number. All the weights are even, uh, all, the, all the weights for edges and, 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 and vertices are even. Another thing, we wanted to know what the value of beta itself is. This is a very simple thing, linear regression. So because the probability is a function of beta times energy, and this function is invertible because e to the power of whatever is invertible, uh, we can do the opposite computation. So we, first we t make a lot of uh, experiments, like half a million. We estimate the probability from the number of successes in these experiments, and then we sort of reverse engineer the value of beta times uh, particular energy. And we do a linear regression after throwing out uh, outliers, it turned out that the beta used by hardware is 32. So we know what the value of beta is. We know what the precision of beta times energy is. So it's time for the final experiment. We generate a cube instance. It doesn't have to be the whole grid. It doesn't have to be the very maximum of possibilities of our research solution. It suffices to take a 6 by 16 grid. Uh, all the coefficients are between minus 30 and 30, and they are all even, not to, uh, not to make them too imprecise. We use our reference solution to find the minimum energy value and its probability according to the ideal Boltzmann distribution, and we see what the hardware does. 
And it seems that the hardware doesn't find the minimum, even though it should find the minimum every 11 samples. We were puzzled once again. We tried tweaking the parameters many, many times, and we failed. And this is, again, the re request to the whole audience to try to help us out, because, oh, I'm out of time. Uh, because, uh, uh, because at this point, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to make the machine return something closer to the Boltzmann distribution. Anyway, I'm out of time. Luckily, this is my last slide. So it seems that I'm exactly uh, where I'm supposed to be. So these are the answers or partial answers to my questions. We can implement a referral solution, but it doesn't scale as well, as good as the hardware approach, because I think nine chimera rows is as much as we can go. 10 would be already extremely difficult because of the exponential nature of the software approach. And basically, we have no idea what is happening with the hardware. Uh, we are not able to configure it so that it returns something reasonably close to the ideal distribution. We would appreciate help. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, uh, question. You know, I I was under the impression that the coupler uh, precision that you end up getting for the for your annealing hardware tends to be a couple of percent. And so, if that's true, then looking at the the, the difference that you have between the ideal minimal energy, right, mm -hmm. and the value you get, I'd imagine that would be within statistical error. Yeah. Have you t done an in-depth statistical analysis? Uh, uh, we did take a look at that. So the. Uh, uh, basically, one thing that's missing f from the slides is the actual distribution of errors among the 20,000 samples that we took. So this is a very nice uh, normal distribution curve. And what we did is we took the square root of the number of uh, couplers times the standard deviation, th which is a proper formal way of, of, of uh, determining the noise of the whole thing, and it's less than 8. So. I know that I, have, I should have included it in the slides, but uh, the, the, the gap between the fa energy found and the ideal energy is much bigger than the expected noise from all the couplers. Uh, but you're welcome to challenge that, because this was explained a lot then.